Hey, and welcome to Winning Conversations. Today, we sit down with one of my favorite people, Larry Brazil. Larry Brazil is a phenomenal man of God. He played in the NFL. He's been a minister. He has spent years pouring into kids through the Boys and Girls Clubs and also hosting uh, his own ministry camps. And we had just had a really great time visiting with him, hearing his story, hearing how he is always really led by the Holy Spirit, and we cannot wait for you to hear it. So let's jump right in. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here, Larry. Thanks for coming and joining us. Yes. Well, thank you very much. It's just a great honor and privilege to be here. It really is. I appreciate it. These are the conversations that I love because I personally have never met you till like right now. And mm-hmm. the whole point of these podcasts are having amazing conversations with amazing people that are in the Heritage of Faith family. Mm-hmm. And I get the privilege of having this conversation. So give us a brief like synopsis of like your, your upbringing, your local Fort Worth boy, right? Born and raised. Okay. First of all, let me say this. God has really been good to me for such a long time. Even when I wasn't serving him, when I look back on my life from the time I was a young boy up until now, I have to say this, God has been good to me for a very, very long time. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I grew up, well, I tease about it all the time. My family and I, we lived in so many different places here in Fort Worth, maybe we moved probably 16, 18 times wow. growing up. Matter what? of fact, my brother and I, we're going to put together a tour. We call it the Brazil tour. We're going to visit <laughs> all the houses. <laughs> all the houses. We'll get all the family together and rent a bus. And we're going to visit all the houses that we lived in. <laughs> East side, west side, north side, Como. We lived everywhere. Stop six. We lived everywhere growing up. And wow. so we was, and then the part of the reason was that is that my my dad wasn't a very good provider. And so my mom struggled with us as kids. And she did a good job in raising us. And my mother, my mother was a God friend woman. And she made me go to church. I didn't like to go to church, but she made me go to church. And the one thing about this is not that I didn't reverence and respect God. It's just that, let me put it this way. I had a reverence and respect for God, but I hated church. Yeah. Because he did absolutely nothing for me. Okay. And how many siblings do you have? It's uh, six of us. Six of you. Yeah, three boys and three girls. Wow. Yeah, and I'm I'm the fourth oldest or the third youngest, whichever one you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm just Squarely. Yeah. Square, seven squarely in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. wow, six. That's, yeah. man. And so... Fort Worth, born and raised, moved around a lot, mm-hmm. but then football clearly was a, a real lane for you that you kind of leaned into. Yeah, I started playing football early. Well, my dad, my dad was a very good football player. Okay. Okay. My dad grew up in Marlin, Texas. But if you go to Marlin, Texas today, everybody know my dad. My, my dad was a very good, now that I can say he did well. He was a very good football player. He was very athletic. Not just football, very athletic. So that's why I got my ability from to play football, as well as my uh, siblings. We were all athletic. That's great. Yeah. And so, uh, 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 so I do have to give him credit for that, though. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, yeah. Did you see? Uh, did you see athletics as an opportunity for you to get to, to get beyond from where you were, where your family was? Well, not initially. Initially, I just loved the game. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't thinking about it. this is an opportunity for me to get it, you know, out of this situation. I just love playing the game. It's good. You know. Yeah. And, what position did you play? Well, I, I, I played defensive back or cornerback. But actually growing up, my love was quarterback. And my first position I ever played for the first couple of years as fifth and sixth grade, I was a quarterback. You know, one grew, grew up back there and wanted to be a defensive back. No, that was not right. the limelight. No. You didn't see that quarterback. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Right. you know, running back. You know, right. yeah, yeah. That, so that's that's what I played, and so, but I kind of got pushed into the defensive back situation. But uh, you know, I, I, I was a pretty good quarterback. All right, you know, as a right. young man, and so, but but sounds like you're a pretty good defensive back. Too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I but to answer your question, you know, I didn't really start 
uh, thinking that way until I got much older. Okay. You know, that it was important for me, you know, to take advantage of my abilities. In other words, to use my athletic ability to get an education. Yeah. So and I try to encourage young people that today. So even if you don't like athletics, yeah. if you're good at it, then use it to get an education. It's yeah. Very cool. yeah. Wisdom. Yeah. 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 And so the older I got, I realized that, hey, this could be an opportunity for me to better myself. And so that's what I did. Yeah. And so high school, you clearly get recognized. Well, no, actually high school, actually in high school, my senior year, I didn't even play football. What? As a junior, uh, and the reason, let me, let me tell you this story. My senior year, I played the first game of the season. Getting ready for the second game of the season, the principal at Dunbar High School walked out on the practice field while I was practicing, put his arm around me and said that you're finished for the year. Academically, you're not eligible for the rest of the school year. Okay, and so that was devastating. Oh, sure. To me. And one of the reasons, one of the things that had happened, uh, about two weeks before school was out, my junior year, a couple of buddies of mine and I, we was walking down Berry Street and we got hit by a car. What? Myself and one of my friends, best friend, we got hit by a car. So I was hospitalized. And, uh, and so I wind up sitting in the hospital for maybe about, it wasn't real long, but uh, I, I didn't pass some of my classes at the end. And so, mm-hmm. so going into the next year, Are academically, I wasn't mm-hmm. uh, uh, eligible. 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 And so that was devastating for me. Sure. You know, and so what happened with that is I just, I walked on as a uh, junior college here in Texas called Cisco Junior College. And, okay. And that, and that situation was, it was very racist. It was a very bad situation for me. So I didn't play that year either. They didn't let me play. And so I just decided not to go back down there, of course. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like you're welcomed. Yeah, <laughs> you were Why not. What's wrong? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, but the but the thing that uh, the way I, I I use that to encourage young people is that is that you can never consider quitting as an option, even when things don't go your way, mm-hmm. and you have to have a dream. See, my dream is what kept me on course. Okay, I always wanted to be, you know, uh, I always wanted to go to college. And so I know I knew that I had to continue to uh, uh, to overcome. And so I use that to encourage young people. I say, get knocked down, just get back up. That's good. That's good advice. Yeah. So what yeah. what got you to USC? I grew up here in Texas, loving USC. What? That, that was always my school. That was really? always your school. That was always my school. Oh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. That was always my school. I yeah. used to watch them on TV, whoop up on Notre Dame and stuff yeah. like that. So I always love, I don't know how, but when I look at it, to tell the truth, when I look at it and I, and, and I reflect back on it, how I got to USC and getting to California was all part of God's plan for my life. Okay. When I initially went to California, I thought I was going out there to play football. But actually, God was taking me out there to, to be born again. That's awesome. Okay, because I grew up in church. Right. But I hated church. And I and, and I had a 60-year plan. A 60-year plan? I had a 60-year plan. <laughs> I was going to do what I wanted to do, live my life I wanted to do, do everything I wanted to do. Around by 60 years old, I was going to accept Christ. That's a that wasn't a good plan. <laughs> not a great plan. It's not a good plan because— At least you had a plan. Be, be, <laughs> because— the way my life was, I never would have made it to 60. Mm. The devil would have killed me. Mm-hmm. I never would have made it to 60, you know? And so I look back on that. And the reason why I say that it was all part of God's plan because God knew what it took for me to get saved. In other words, like I say, I love God, but I just, I didn't see any advantage of going to church. The only advantage I saw in going to church and serving God was, was going to heaven. That's the only advantage. I didn't think it had, would do anything for me in this life. Which I guess and, that makes your plan make sense. Like when yeah. I'm 60, <laughs> yeah. punch my ticket yeah, and I'll be ready good. To go. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll square up my bank account. Right. Yeah. Close the tab out. 
Yeah. Right. And so that 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 was my 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 plan. And so when I went to California and 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 and, and this is where my wife came in at. She invited me to go uh, to Frederick Price Church with her. My wife, nice. she did. Yeah. She had been born again two years, in 76 prior to... to uh, now, quickly explain how you met your wife the first time. Well, my wife, actually, my wife and I, we grew up together, going to school together. Out here in Fort Worth. In Fort Worth, yeah. But you met her again, and she's a Bruin. She's a Bruin. UCLA Bruin. If you don't UCLA know, <laughs> California, <laughs> USC, and UCLA, they are not what you call friends. Right. <laughs> so I was like, that's so amazing. You grew up yeah. with her, and she's going to your rival college. Yeah, 11 miles apart. I, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And so it's an it's a, it's a, it's a inner city rivalry. Most of them are interstate rivals or out of state rivals, right. you know, but this is an inner city it's level an LA mile. rivalry. Yeah. Rivalry, yeah. yeah. And see, back to uh, what I was saying about getting saved, um, my wife invited me to Pastor Price's church, and I went to the service. And actually, the first time I heard him preach, I said to myself, that's what I want. The first time I heard him. You know, so he gave the invitation for me to, for those who want to get saved and filled with the Spirit, and um, and so when he gave the invitation, I said, mm, "I got to thinking. Eh, I can't do this anymore. If I go up there, I can't do this <laughs> anymore anymore. No, I better not go up there. Yeah, oh, so I no. didn't. So I didn't. I didn't go up there. Oh. I didn't go." What year was this? I'm sorry. 1978. This was 78. March, March okay. 1978. Yeah, I remember it. And so I left that service not being born again. That was my opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I thank God because in between that time and the following week, I could have went to hell. I could have died. That was my opportunity. But all that week at college, I just couldn't get that experience off my mind. Mm. It just stayed with me. I just stayed with me because I knew it was real, and I knew that's what I wanted. And so what I did the following Sunday, I didn't call my my wife. I didn't tell her anything. I just got in my car and went back to the service the next Sunday. And this time when he gave the invitation, I went up. I got saved. I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's been great ever since. Okay, and I called her and told her. She said, you what? <laughs> you went back. Yeah. You know, and so ever since, and, and the thing that, that that's so amazing about that, God knew what I needed to hear. Mm -hmm. And that's why he put me in that position to hear from Pastor Price. And, and, he, he, and, he, and he will forever be my spiritual father. That's so awesome. Yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of like how, 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 how I got. And ever since then, you know, I've I've been, you know, serving God. But although the following week I was back up in the line again, the guy who ministered to him, I said, now, let me make sure I understand this. Okay. I understand what you're saying. I need to come to church and I need to do certain things. I say, and I say, now it's okay to have a girlfriend, right? <laughs> he, he said, well, yeah, it's fine. I said, it's okay to have sex with just one girl, right? He said, no, brother. You can't do and I, and I kind of dropped my head and say, what have I done? You know? but, uh, uh, but I made the decision. You know, I say, okay, I'm, I'm going to stick with it. And so that's kind of like the way that things went. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a big adjustment from a lifestyle of, you know, a football player probably enjoying college life yeah. to getting saved. Yeah. I mean, what was that college experience after that point? Well, it was a big adjustment because you have to understand, uh, I wasn't just a player on my team. I had a cousin out there, a first cousin out there, that he was heavily into drugs. Mm. So I was also the pipeline to help getting drugs to my team. Oh, no. Okay. And so uh, when I got saved, I, I told all the guys, I said, guys, I don't do that no more. 
And they say, Bazil, you just playing, man. You ain't, you ain't, you ain't, you're not, you're not serious. I say, man, I don't do that no more. I say, I don't, I, don't, I, I say, I don't do drugs no more. I don't, I don't sell drugs. I don't help my cousins. I said, I don't do that anymore. So they just, they kept coming because they, they didn't think I was serious at first. So they kept coming, they kept coming, but I stayed faithful and stayed consistently. Then eventually they, they just stopped coming and they realized that I was really serious about living for God. And so my whole personality and connection with my teammates has changed, but it was still good. They, they respected me. We got along fine, but they just realized now, hey, I'm a totally different person. That's awesome. Okay, and so my 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 life on the team was totally was was totally different. I said the social pressures of those situations to go mm-hmm. from being, hey, you're the guy that this is the guy that we use for this, you know, Brazil's this, mm-hmm. to like a complete 180 to like, hey, that's such a it's a huge deal. It's a testimony to your strength of character to main really it is to say, hey, this is I, this is the commitment I've made, and yeah. I'm going to make this commitment, and I'm going to hold to it. Yeah. It's so easy to, to you know, it's like, ah. Hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of my things has always been, when I when I came to Christ, my attitude had always been, I'm going to pursue Christ just like I pursue sports. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be committed to him just like I was committed to sports. I want to be a starter mm-hmm. Christian. I don't want to be a, you know, a Christian that sits on the bench. It's good. That's perfect. Okay, and so that was always my attitude when it came to uh, making that transition from from the world to becoming a, uh, a Christian, and well, I mean, just to continue with the football, your dedication to football got you a shot in the pros. Exactly. Yeah, it did. So, yeah. did you had you already married uh, Linda at that point? No, or? actually, Linda and I didn't get married until my second year. At USC. No, actually, my third year in, in the in the pros. In the pros, okay. Yeah, now, that, now that's a, a pretty good story. Now, I'm proud to get married to my wife. I would love to hear it. <laughs> proud to get married to my wife. I was engaged three months earlier to someone else. What? Wow. Yeah. I thought. Wait. I thought you were dating your wife. No, you- we never. Me and my wife never dated. What? Never. You just were friends. You're just friends. Yeah, we just friends. We never dated. And she invited you to yeah. to the Price's church. We never dated. Really? Yeah. But I, I was engaged three three months prior uh, to another lady that uh, young lady that I was uh, dating at USC. And so w- what actually happened is that we had uh, got engaged, and we were making plans to get married. Uh, I I can remember it was back in January during the off season. I was I was playing with the Baltimore Colts there. It was in the off season. I was at her mom's and dad house in Houston, and we were sitting in the room talking about uh, wedding plans. And and one thing I noticed, and I didn't know much about being led by the Spirit of God. I didn't know I was a new Christian. I, I was born again in '78. This was like 1980, 81, yeah. early '81, something like early '81. I didn't know much about being led by the Spirit, but but one thing I did realize that every time we would talk about getting married, something just wasn't right in here. Mm. I just knew something wasn't right. right. And so what what I told her, I said, I'm going back to Baltimore, and I said, I'm going to find out from God whether we're supposed to get married. Those are my last words. The last words I, that I said to her. you know. And so I went back to Baltimore, and you, you know that over there, the scripture where the, where the Bible says, you know, you get in your closet. You know, mm-hmm. I actually got in the closet. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know. I, your war room. Yeah, I, I had a big closet in my apartment, and I actually got in the closet and sat on the floor, and I read Kenneth Hagin's book, How to Be Led by the Spirit That's of God. A good book. Okay, and from reading that book, I I remember when he was talking about the red light and the green light and mm-hmm. things like that. Right then I made this, I say, that's it, that's God, I'm not supposed to marry her, mm. okay? And so I called her, and as Wes wrote her a letter and told her, you know, basically make a long story short that we were not to get, we cannot get married, mm. okay? But at the same time, God made it really in my heart that I were to marry my, that Linda would be my wife, mm. you know? 
But then also during that time, he was working on her as well, okay? And so we, we wind up we wind up talking. It's, it's a little funny story. She sent me this book, and she says she, she meant well, you know, uh, in regards to me and the other lady that I was engaged to. She had sent me this book prior to us breaking up. She had sent me this little book. And the title of the little book was, is it really love? <laughs> oh. Come on now, Linda. <laughs> you know what you're doing, Linda. <laughs> you know, so anyway. She's playing 3D chess. Yeah. Yo, but we went, we, we got together, we got married, and uh, she knew uh, what she was doing. We yeah. know, and, we, and we never dated. No one on one date. You just got you know. married. You just went like, hey, let's hey. get married. Yeah, I called her. We talked over the phone. I flew into Tulsa, Oklahoma. We did premarital counsel there at, at uh, Pastor Buddy Harrison. It was the church he was right. a part of. He was our pastor. Uh, we we did pre, premarital counsel there. And I, and I flew back in again, and we got married there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Just me, her, and the preacher and, and, the, and the witness. We never dated. That's incredible. Uh, yeah. That's an, like, and now amazing. how many years have you been married? July 4th would be 40, what, 43? Yeah, you 4th of July? 4th of July. We got married 4th of July. America celebrates her independence. <laughs> I lost mine on July 4th. <laughs> so, yeah. so this is a weird question because I'm always curious. How did you discover Kenneth Hagen? How did, through my wife. So she was more the word. Yeah, she 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 was already, like I said, when we got when I got saved, she had already been born again two years. Okay. And so she kind of like introduced me to Brother Hagen. Okay, I I, uh, I started out with Pastor Price and and uh, Kenneth Copeland. Those are my two main people. Mm -hmm. And even today, you know, before Pastor Price went on into heaven, he was still. You know, he, I still consider him my spiritual father, but I've I, I learned most in my in, uh, uh, in my years as a Christian from Brother Copeland. Okay, he's really I've had I really have learned a lot, you know, from him, and and over the years, and, and my and my wife, uh, she started out she and she still does. She said she's always like Jerry Savelle, Pastor Savelle. Matter of fact, we went to his church over here. When it was behind the seminary right. south, she took me over there and she said, Well, Pastor Savelle is gonna marry me. This is what we weren't even dating. She mm -hmm. said, Yes, who I want to marry me, Brother Jerry. You Aww. know, and so but we really uh just we became a member of the Heritage of Faith family. You know, uh we really Brother Jerry is really high on our list. We really love Brother Jerry, you know, and Carol and they mean so much to us. Being as 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 Brother Copeland's is a, a, a massive influence in your life, your spiritual walk. Mm. But you guys have both chosen to be here at Heritage of Faith. What mm. was what made that decision? Just locality, or just no, like no, no, no. House? We we don't we don't we don't go to churches. We never have been going to churches based on location. Okay. We was back in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, back in Cleveland, when I played, when I was with with the Browns, we used to go to a church that was pretty far out. And we started a little slogan, and we said, "A church alive is worth the drive." There it is. Okay, come on. And so we don't we don't mind driving if it's a you know lively church. So we want want to make we just want to make sure that we can go to a church where, first of all, where we can get planted, okay, and then also where where we can grow, you know, and be a blessing to the local body. Tanya and I live in the same city, so we drive by five churches on the way yeah. to this church. Right. So people always ask, yeah. why do you drive all the way to Crowley? I'm like... Yeah. <laughs> it, it's very, it's a true statement. I mean, I think that if you're committed to going where God wants you, then distance, yeah. distance is not a not, a, not an issue. Yeah. yeah we lived on the other side of Fort Worth for a long time, and we drove the hour to church back and forth with infant twins because we knew this is where God had planted us. So... Yeah. I hear that. I, I appreciate that yeah. your heart is to, to really yeah. just honor God with local church yeah. connection. Yeah, and one of the things I didn't mention about me and my wife when we first got married, um, first of all, let me say this. My wife is 
next to my relationship with, with God and what he's done in my life, my wife is such a blessing to me. We don't have any, any, any kids. And that's my only regret in life is that we don't have mm-hmm. any kids because not so much for me, but I would have loved to see my wife raise my kids. She would have been a great, mm-hmm. she would have been a great mother. I tell her that she had been a great mother, you know, and I really, 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 you know, miss that. And it's not that we couldn't, we just, but well, we had a miscarriage in 85. And then for some reason, we just, just never did plan after that and time just kind of got us. But I, I talk to her sometimes, say, are you willing to be uh, Sarah? I mean, I believe God to be Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> Are you willing to be Sarah? Yeah. You know, we're not done but, yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the thing about it is that after we got married, a short period of time, about a month later, I sat my wife down in in, in our dining room and I looked her square in the face. I say, I just had to talk with my lawyer. I want a divorce. Wow. Yeah, I say this is not working. And her and I say we miss God. But she said, No, we didn't. And we just kinda like going back and forth. I said, Yes, we did. She said, No, we did. I said, Yes, we <laughs> we did. And so and what what was happening is that I, I just I just wasn't happy. And I go to practice, I wasn't focused, I didn't want to come home, you know. I just wasn't happy. And it wasn't anything. She, my wife wasn't doing anything. It was all me. Mm-hmm. It was, it was, she was a hundred percent doing what she wanted to do. I even called my mom and I called my mom and kind of explained to her. And she said, what is she doing? <laughs> you know, yeah. I said, mom, is she not doing anything? Yeah. You know, it's me. But what well, well, that happened, it was just a social, the, uh, the soulless adjustment I was making from that other relationship. Yeah. I really hadn't gotten over that relationship the mm-hmm. way I should have. Did not I trust God. And so I wasn't adjusting well. And so what I did was I set my wife down and say, look, this is what I'm going to do. Because I had been just started studying about the love of God. And, and I was reading some things about the love of God and listening to some things with Brother Coburn about the love of God. And I say, Right now in my heart, I don't feel like I love you. I'm loving you the way I should, I say. But as an act of faith, I'm going to love you according to the word of God, the way the Bible tells me to love you, mm-hmm. you know, as an act of my will. Mm-hmm. And I'm trusting God, you know, to change everything else, okay? And that's what I did. And then God changed everything, you know, around and, you know, and then it's it's not an effort to love my wife anymore. I mean, I got through that. So you when know. you said God changed everything around, he changed you. Yeah, yeah he changed me. He I changed made the you. decision I was going to love my wife regardless of how I felt. That's good. <clears throat> so I was just basically for a while just going on my how I felt. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't. And so mm-hmm. I know that when you put God's love first, it'll change your heart. It'll change your whole surroundings and everything. That's so. That was the first you said month or so of your relationship that you set your wife down. Yeah. And then how long into that relationship before you found yourself really, almost getting your stride of like really seeing her the way that God it, it, wanted you to see her? It probably was. Just, it wasn't long. Okay. It wasn't very long at all. Because I made a decision. So the thing about me is that when you know I, when I make a decision about something, and I'm gonna put everything into it. Okay. Okay. And so, and I ask God, I say, God, show me how to love my wife. Show me the little things I can do, little things I can say, you know, to love my wife. I say, show me, because I, I, I need you to show me. And I tell people that, couples that all the time, because my wife and I, we do some marriage counseling. You know, you have to make a decision when it comes to your wife, when you come to your relationship. You have to. Ask God and to show you little things you can do to be a blessing to your wife, to your spouse. If there was one piece of advice you could give to young couples who find themselves maybe where you were at, mm-hmm. where the the feeling's not necessarily there, mm-hmm. but they know 
God put them in this relationship. They understand the mm-hmm. workings. What would you say to the to those couples? Well, I would say understand your responsibility as a husband and as a wife. Know what that is. If you, the Bible says, "Husband, love your wife." Period. If you do that, you have no problem. And then you and your wife won't have any any problems submitting to you as a husband. When the Bible says, "Wives, submit to your husband." Mm-hmm. If you're loving her. She will have my problems submitting to you, okay? So, uh, so if you understand that, that regardless of how your spouse treats you, that don't that, that doesn't change the way you treat them. Mm-hmm. If you understand, that. I'm gonna love my wife regardless of how she treats me. Mm-hmm. And so I can't really in faith stand before God and say, "Well, God, I know you said love my wife, but." You know, she, you know, she, <laughs> however, did. Yeah. 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 Were you that, aware she's going yeah. to behave like this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that That's not acceptable. Right. It's good. You know? It's good advice. That's, no, it's really good. But did you, from that time, set, you started doing ministry shortly thereafter in Baltimore, correct? Or did you? I retired from the NFL to go into ministry full time. Okay. Was that in Cleveland, Cleveland. or was that in Baltimore? Cleveland. 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 Okay. Yeah. Cleveland. Now, now. I was in Cleveland, but I was still living in my home church and everything was still in Baltimore. Okay. I still had my house in Baltimore when I was staying in Cleveland. Okay. And I knew going into my last year, which was my seventh year. You played seven years in the NFL. Yeah. That that, 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 that would be my last year. Okay. I knew that already. Now, but actually, I wanted to play another year, but I knew in my heart that this was my last year. And when you say going into ministry, did you have like a specific ministry that you felt called to, or just, you just wanted to be? Well, no, I, at, at that, at that time, um, my pastor back in Baltimore, Maryland, he had already, uh, told me, he said, well, when you get ready to retire, you know, just make sure you talk to me. Cause we was always active in the church, my wife and I, and so uh, uh, when we got ready to re- when I got ready to retire, one of the things I did, I left and went to West Virginia, which is not far from Maryland. One of the uh, one of my church members, her, she and her husband had a, a little cabin in the country. So I, I, I asked him if I could use it. So I, I went up there and stayed for a few days up there in the cabin and just prayed and sought God. And, uh, and I knew that then it was time for me to uh, to go into the to the ministry, not so much uh, with a specific calling, but just to be in the ministry for a time. And so, the pastor brought me on as the the, the, the associate pastor there at the mm-hmm. church, uh, uh, and and uh, and uh, and I was responsible for the entire youth department from the infants all the way up to teenagers. As well as uh, assistant to, to the uh, pastor, and then we really didn't have a youth pastor, and so my wife and I we we sat down and we prayed about it. this. Was 1988. I went to ministry in 86, 86, 87. Yeah, 86. I was licensed in the day in 86, 87. Uh, okay. Pastor Buddy Harrison, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, so we we didn't have a youth pastor, so we just prayed. So well, well, maybe you know, Lord, do you want us to be the youth pastor? So we we wound up being the youth pastors as well as the the, the social pastor, and, and we and we really and that's how we got involved in the youth ministry, my wife and I. Yeah. And so we stayed there for seven years, mm-hmm. and after seven years, we just felt you know God wanted us to uh, to leave Baltimore. And come back to to stop six. Come back to to our home, and we started working with uh, young people in the stop six. Was room. it with your time in youth ministry that you fell in love with young people and serving them? Because the next step in your life was the boys and girls club. I've always, even when I was playing football, I I went to camps and worked with kids, you know, kids and things like that. And I did some youth camps for uh, uh, FCF. Okay. Christian Fellowship, I did their youth camp a few years and things like that. So we, we've always had a heart for young people. And actually, when we came back here, 
we actually actually started a ministry, and we still do, but we kind of put it on hold when, when COVID hit. We kind of, sure. we actually had a, a ministry out in Stop 6, and we actually met with teenagers on Sundays. We actually had a church on Sundays for teenagers. Nice. Apart from the Boys and Girls Club. Okay. Yeah. Do you think it's because of your upbringing of not having that father figure role model like that, you know, your that father, you had your brother obviously as your as your first hero, but that that has made it such an impetus for you to be that for a lot of young men that don't have that. Yeah, I I, I take advantage of that, but I don't I don't necessarily believe that that was just a specific calling and that I just just realized there's a need, mm-hmm. you know, in that area and I do my best to try to be that uh, father figure for a lot of those young men and young women. You know, I, and I, one of the things about when I worked at the Boys and Girls Club, one of the things that that kids, and they still do now, they want, I, kids should walk up to me. I go by Mr. Larry. That's what all the kids call me. They call me Mr. Larry. That's what, all the, that's what I know. At the Boys and Girls Club, that's what they know me by, Mr. Larry. And, and they would, you know, kids would walk up to Mr. Larry, tell him, you my uncle, you know, or they'll say, Mr. Larry, will, will you be my daddy, you know? Uh-huh. And I say, yes, if you want me to be, you know, and that in, that in itself t- told me something that, you know, kids are hurting for that fatherly re- relationship, mm-hmm. you know? And even to to this day, even some of the, my older kids, they, they still, that's what they call me, they call me, they call me Uncle Larry or they, you know, and they call me, and they say, "This is my dad." Matter of fact, the lady, the, the young lady who, who's running the boys and girls club right now, she grew up in the club. She's one of my kids. She grew up in the club, and she she actually took my place, and she's running the club. And she called me dad. That's what she called me, dad. Wow. That's so good. Yeah. What an impact on that entire mm-hmm. community, that generation. Mm-hmm. Was there uh, when you went to the boys and girls club? Was there uh, that was your one of your communities you grew up in, right? Well, it was. I could walk. If I left the Boys and Girls Club, I could be at my mom's house probably in three minutes. Wow, that's what made it so special. Yeah. Being you know, being at the Boys and Girls Club in that community, mm-hmm. that's what made it so so special because we're the Boys and Girls Club facilities located i used to walk past it every day mm-hmm. that property used to be cows on that property okay it just used to be you know it, it wasn't anything going on just a bunch of cows on the property you know going on my way to school you know and so just to see what it is now and to be able to, to be at to go back there and be a part of that community and what and then and, and, and part of those kids lives that means it's always been a special place for me yeah yeah That's- yeah. So, fun. so you're at the Boys and Girl Club. You have this. You have a lot of moving parts in your life with the ministry mm-hmm. and, and pouring mm-hmm. out into communities. Mm-hmm. What brought you back to Her- or What brought you to Heritage of Faith and all that journey? Well, what brought me to Heritage of Faith? I I don't just go to church anywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to go to a church somewhere where I know that first of all, where I, where I, that. I can grow somewhere I can grow, okay? And even though I'm a minister, I know it's important that I have a pastor. I don't believe in just, you know, hey, I'm a minister, I don't need any, you know, I I, I need mm-hmm. a so pastor. Authority or covering. Uh, okay, so. Sound so, wisdom right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so, and we wanted to set it up under someone we knew that it was a good covering, and we know that Brother Jerry was, you know, had a part in this ministry, and so we knew it would be a good place to place to come. And actually, we we uh, we uh, um, and we had some friends going here as well, mm-hmm. uh, Steve and Sandra Baldwin. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We Steve and I play football together at Dunbar. I didn't know that. Yeah. He's on. We we were teammates at, at Dunbar High School. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, uh, that was one of the. Co- connections there too but actually to tell the truth though i didn't know steve that was going here when, when we when came you started yeah, yeah. We, i didn't know he was going here 
you connected afterwards. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And as far as the Boys and Girls Club, I never intended to be at the Boys and Girls Club 25 years. I figured I'd be there, be there a couple of years. What kept you there? Well, it's like when I got ready to retire from the NFL, I knew in here it was time for me to go. Mm-hmm. So I stayed at the Boys and Girls Club until I knew in here mm-hmm. that it was time for me to go. And when it got to that point, I knew I had to leave. Yeah. You know, I knew it was time for me to, it was time for me to meet, me to leave because it's just in my heart, I just knew that I, I had did my time, did what God wanted me to do here, and it was, it was time for me to, time for me to leave. There's just one underlying theme that I just keep hearing as you're telling your story um, from the time you got saved through everything. If you heard from God, you did it. There wasn't mm-hmm. another question. Um, mm-hmm. That's not always that's not always the way people walk through the relationship with the Lord. Like sometimes there's a battle there mm-hmm. in your heart and your spirit. I mean, I know you probably experienced some of that too, yeah. but what would you say to, um, to young ministers or to people who are really seeking God? How do you, how do you get that, that strength of character to say, if God told me to do this, if God told me to go to this church to be part of this organization, mm-hmm. then I'm going to stick it out through the thick and thin. Well, well the, the thing that I would say to anybody was this, is that you have to understand that God knows you better than, know your, better than you know yourself. And God knows what's best for you. And that's where the trust come in. Mm-hmm. Now you have to say, God, you created me. You know how I function, okay? And so if you're telling me to do something, then that has to be what's best for me, okay? It has to be what's best for me, Mm -hmm. okay? Because I was just sharing with some of my boys yesterday in the football camp. I say, the people who build the Ford automobile, they know how that automobile works, okay? And so if something breaks down on it, they know how to fix it. Okay, they know the ins and the outs of it. And I was telling them, God know you. He know what's best for you. So you need to, I was talking to them about listening and following instructions. I said, you have to listen to God's uh, wisdom and instruction for your life if you want to be successful. Okay, and so when it comes to, uh, as far as your question, if we understand that, that God created us. He made us, and so when he's leading us to do something, it has to be right. Mm-hmm. It has to be what's best for us. That's good. Yeah. I mean, how do you how do you repeat you make that? It so, you make it sound complicated. <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound so tricky. You mean just listen <laughs> and obey? What are you yeah. talking about here? Yeah. yeah. I like to add seventeen steps to that. Yeah. A lot of times we can get it. It gets. Uh, it can get mixed in the minutia of life yeah. and the emotions and things like that. So that's yeah. it. I always love that the gospel is simple and clear so simple. Yeah. and hearing from God really, I mean, we can complicate it a thousand yeah. different ways, but yeah. it's really inspiring to hear somebody who's walked through so many different kind of seasons and positions in life. And um, whether you were in the NFL or the boys and girls mm-hmm. club or starting your, you know, ministry things, you were, that was always a consistent in your life. And so I appreciate that. And, uh, um, I want to hear a little bit more about the football camps that you're doing. Cause that's an out, that's a ministry outreach that you've started. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Tell it us is. about that. This would be my third year. This, this, this actually, this is my third year. And, um, my football camp is a little different in most football camps. First of all, most um, NFL players, uh, whether they're active or retired, most of their camps, a couple things. One, they bring in a lot of kids. I'm going to bring in no more than 40 kids. Okay. Secondly, they charge a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I don't charge any money for my camps. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, uh, their camps are only maybe one or two days, maybe three days. My camp is for 10 days, okay? Now, uh, the reason it's for 10 days is because of the position I play, defensive back, cornerback. It's very skillful. It's a very skilled, technical position. Okay. There's the, the most technical positions in football. One is quarterback, and then two is cornerback. 
It takes a lot of skill to play both of those positions. And so that's why my cap is for 10 days because it takes time to perfect those skills, okay? And then, and, and that's the reason why I don't bring in a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. I don't bring in no more than four. I think I had 37 kids to sign up for my camp this year, which is great. I think I had um, 24 to show up, you know, kids sign up and they don't. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> they don't, they don't, <laughs> which I don't want, I don't want to stay in that, but, you know. Uh, they need I, I to listen what, to this podcast yeah, yeah. and they make your yes, your yes, your yes. Yes is your yes. Yeah, no, yeah, no. yeah they, they don't show up, you know. But and so, and then uh, and then I don't charge because I want any kid to be able to come to my camp, whoever desire mm -hmm. to want to get better. I don't want a cost to be a factor for the kid not to be able to get better. Right. That's okay. Great. Because I know how I was when I was coming up, and and I shared this with the kids. I say, man. If, if if someone like me would have had a camp like this when I was growing up, man, I'd be here. I wouldn't miss a day. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't miss a day. You know, I say because, you know, what you, let me put it in perspective. If I were to charge what I'm doing, if I were to charge kids for, for, for my camp, they would have to pay well over $1,000. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I did I did basketball hoops through through high school, and I went to camps like that all of the time, all summer yeah. long, all yeah. all spring long, yeah. and uh, and they are pricey. Those are yeah. pricey yeah. camps. And my mom was a single mom, and it was a lot of work. I I worked to put myself yeah. in those camps. So yeah. a free yeah. camp would have been, especially <laughs> one with a skill that yeah. you're teaching them that's going to help them get to the next level of their game. Yeah, that wasn't a patty cake camp. You know, sometimes camps can be yeah. A little bit f more yeah. for fun. More camp. <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah, so yeah. it's right. good. You're absolutely right. And so the, and, and, and then the thing about my camp too is that I have a life skills. Every uh um uh, every fit I start my camp out with a prayer, we pray. And then I, I, I cover life skill with them. Like I think yesterday I talked to them about confidence versus fear. Talk about honor and respect. Talk about listening and Father and instructions. We talk about persevering, but all of it is from a godly perspective. Everything we talked about is from a. We talked about the difference between a fantasy and a dream. Okay, so but but everything I do with them is from a godly perspective because you'll be so amazed and surprised at the number of kids today who don't go to church. Just absolutely don't go to church. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up in a generation like that. Right. As bad as a lot of kids were in my neighborhood, we all still went to church. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, and we had some bad kids, but they, but you gonna go to church, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And that's the thing about my mom. She made me go to church, and I and I and, and bless my mama's heart. She's in heaven, but she made me go to church, and I and I thank God for that every almost yeah. every day. Yeah. She made us go to church, mm -hmm. and I could stay out as late as I wanted to when I was in high school. But I'm going to church. But you're going to church that next day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I thank my mama for that because I learned a, a, a certain amount of respect for God, mm -hmm. even though I didn't care much about church, but I still understood. I feared God. I reverenced God. Okay. I knew that God was real. I knew that there was a heaven. I knew that there was a hell. And I also knew this. I knew I was hell bound. Mm -hmm. I knew that. I didn't, I didn't fool myself like that. I knew, I knew if I died, I was going to hell, mm -hmm. you know. And I actually used to pray and come home, whether I'm high or we've been drinking or whatever, I, I should always get on my knees and pray, Lord, one day I, I want to be saved, my wife and my kids. And that's why I used to pray. I don't want to go to hell. I should pray that as, as, as a uh, sinner. I ask this question all the time myself like what could have someone said to me in my season the same way you were in your season what could have someone said to you that would have made you you know what i don't have to wait to know the answer to that question i can get saved right now i mean you waited till college and i'm so thank the lord that that got there but is there something that could have been so what could have been spoken into you that would have made you go you know what i, I want that for myself now I wouldn't have had to see something 
uh, hear, hear, hear a word of God that, like I heard from Pastor Price, mm -hmm. because although I went to church, I had a lot of bad examples in the church, mm -hmm. whether it's the preacher smoking, mm -hmm. committing adultery, uh, and it was just, it was not good examples, you know, and so I didn't want anything to do with that. Because I say, I'm doing that, so what's the advantage of me doing that? <laughs> right. You know, I look just like the world. You know? Right. And so, so it was really no example. With me, I'm, I'm the type of, I have to see something. See, you, 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 in other words, you just can't tell me something. I have to see you doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not just going to take your word and say, oh, yeah, take this. It works. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, you, got, well, you got to show me that it, that it works first. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and, and no one really talked about the love of God. When I was coming up, right. Matter of fact, in my family, we never used the word love. When I was growing up, my mother never told me she loved me, but I know she did. Mm -hmm. My my siblings, we never said love. We didn't start using the love word until after I got saved, and I started using it with my family, mm -hmm. and then they started using it. Using it back. Yeah, but before I got saved and start expressing my love for them and saying I love you and then we never we never use that. Now it's it's common in the family. Yeah. But that's it so me getting saved didn't just affect me, it affected my whole family. Yeah. That's awesome. Well and that's no wonder that you had to walk through that season with your wife where you had to really study the love of God in order to love her well. I yeah. mean if you're not raised with it, you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You can't be mad at someone that don't know something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um I don't know. You're your story is incredible, and I think it's going to touch a lot of people. One of the things that we say a lot around here at Heritage is, you know, this house is about making winners in life. Um, it's something Pastor preaches from, Dr. Seville mm -hmm. talks about, you know, no quit attitude, those mm -hmm. kind of things. When you hear that statement, making winners in life, and that's what you're doing with these, you mm -hmm. know, these young men that come to your camps and, and the ministry that pours out of you, what, is that, what does that mean? Making a winner in life? Yes, sir. Well... <laughs> One of the things, let me, let, me, let me preface that by saying this. Uh, the purpose of uh, my wife and I in working with young people is to teach, train, and develop young people, to teach and train teenagers to be successful young people, okay? In other words, too many times we want to wait till we get a certain age before we start talking about success, Okay? Night for take for instance, when I, young people, what I'm trying to get them to understand is that God wants you to be a success right now. Not when you get 30, mm -hmm. not when you get my age, but he wants you to be a success right. right now, okay? And he's ready for you right now. Now, when you get 30, he wants you, he want you to make a difference right now. But the thing is that we have to first understand that God has a plan and purpose for our life and that it's not a matter of us deciding on what we're going to be. It's a matter of us discovering what God has already called us to be. See, we don't have a right to decide what we want to be. God's already decided that. And I tell young people all the time coming out of high school, that's not your responsibility to determine what you're going to be. Or what your purpose is. God's already decided that and purpose for you. Your responsibility is to discover what God has already purposed mm -hmm. you to be. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if you want to be a one in life, that's where it starts. Understanding that God has a plan. He has a purpose for my life. And it's my responsibility to find out what that is. Okay? And then being a one in life is just basically understanding, first of all, that you're precious to God. You're valuable. Okay, you you very valuable, and I tell especially young girls at all time. I just tell them, I said, you know, you're precious and valuable to God. I said, don't ever let anybody else tell you anything different than that. Okay, and I think, and if we understand that we're valuable and we're precious to God, and not let anybody or anything alter that, then I think that's the key. I think that's really the key right there. Okay, I really do. Love it. Love it. That's a great answer. 
Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think I'll link that book that you mentioned, Dr. Dr. Hagen's book, Kenneth Hagen's book, Being Led by the Spirit of mm-hmm. God was mm-hmm. at it. Mm-hmm. I've read it too. It changed my life also. Yeah. So we'll find it and link it in the show notes. Well, it was just a, a real honor to sit down and hear your story, uh, even more bits of it and, and what God's doing in your life, what God's doing through your, through your ministry. And we appreciate you being part of our heritage family. You're, you're an important part. We didn't get to touch a whole lot on it, on it on the show, but you do work with our outreach team with Joseph and go to the detention center and things like that. So um, Heritage Family, if you see him out and about or you see him as part of some of the outreach teams, make sure you um, or see him just on a Sunday morning. Make sure you give him a high five and, and connect with him. So thank you again for being part of our, our show. And um, we'll be back next week with another winning conversation. Mm-hmm.